Good evening. Good evening, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good, evening, good, good lunchtime, whatever it may be, for wherever you are in the world. Thank you all very, very much for coming to join me. It's been a bit of a gap there. Been over uh, at Exposure, which was an incredible experience and an amazing privilege to have been invited to teach there again, and they want me back another time. And I, you know what, I was kind of nervous about going with what, everything that's going on in the world, obviously. But you know, the airlines were absolutely amazing. As for exposure, nothing could have been more incredible. We were having tests every 48 hours to create a bubble between us there. And then it was all super great between everyone. So anyway, I'm back and I'm now allowed out because I've had to stay at home and all that stuff. So look at all you people from all over the world. How amazing. Thank you so much for coming. I had the usual panic getting the tech working. So what do we got tonight? Well, obviously it's a little bit different, so we're going to keep it just a little bit shorter with my stuff. There won't be quite so much on the feedback thing, but I've got a few pictures I want to talk to you about and obviously go through our couple of help ones and a few shortlist shout outs and go through our winners and runners up. We'll do that for about 20 minutes. Then we're going to be joined by multiple Pulitzer award-winning photographer, RFK award-winning photographer as well, Estra Suarez, who I met a year or two ago. He's one of the loveliest guys in the world. And I think you'll find him really interesting. He's going to be talking to us a bit about decisive moments, but not the sort you might be thinking of, and telling us some of the backstory behind some of his images which I think you're going to enjoy. Please feel free to ask questions. I've got my other laptop over here to the side and I'll be keeping an eye on them. And so maybe if, if actually anyone want to ask a question or if somebody does, then I will do what I can to try and catch them as they come in. Um, so just before we begin looking at our pictures, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, some superhero donators this time because PLD is supported by those little regular donations. Without them... No one would be able to pay for Joe, the cameraman, and the time it takes and all the rest of it. So big thank you to Jack Van Oosten and Michael Isles and Matt Johnson. You've been really generous. We all owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you so much for helping to keep the boat afloat. So let's go have a look at some pictures, shall we? I've got so many different windows open here. I need to sort my life out just for a moment. Right. Great, I think everything's good, all the sounds good, and I think we are good to go. So, first of all, I need to just sort my pictures out. Here we go. So again, Estrus, this picture kind of sums up who this guy is. He's a big guy with a big personality and a very big heart, and he's a whole pile of fun. I'm sure he'll be talking to you about probably this image for which he is which he's most proud, um, as well as the backstory behind some of the other things that he's done, such as war photography. This one has an amazing story. I hope he tells you about it. Um, but he also covers other stories as well. And I think you'll agree, he really is an amazing photographer. As are all of you, because in this challenge, you really nailed it. Um, you know, I've kind of decided to try and keep time I spend on the videos a bit shorter and also to give you more freedom to be more creative by just trying some, trying to sow some ideas for you <coughs> to work with. And boy, you really did. Um, obviously, we're not going to be able to go through so many images tonight, but let's just begin. Let's just have a little look some pictures so I'm just going to talk about a few where I just feel the photographer needs just a little bit of help then we're going to have a look at some of our shortlist shout outs and then go into the winners and runners up Estrus by the way has gone to get a sandwich and uh, I just hope he shows up on time <laughs> we'll give him some stick if he doesn't so our friend here, age cousin, Aji cousin. I like your idea because all those footprints in the snow, that is very much kind of a walk, isn't it? And I, and I get it, you're going for a walk, you're out there, you're in the world, and I think it's great fun. My only possible question to you though is it just looks a little bit dark. Now this is an exposure thing because exposure is part of your creative expression as well. So I took the liberty of just brightening it up a little bit. 
let's just change this from um, smooth to a more direct cut and flick back and forth. Just see what you think. So this is your original and then I just took the liberty of just brightening it up a bit. Just a little hint more exposure can absolutely make a world of difference. Najib, I really liked your idea here because it really kind of gives the, the feeling, the spirit of going for a walk in the sunshine and being playful. I love the way the child's arm is out. It's kind of like great fun. It really is great fun. For you, I just want to give you a little bit of coaching about composition because, again, I kind of took the liberty of just changing your composition a little bit. I don't know what you think, guys, but I just find that just by putting the child down at the bottom of the picture, it somehow just opens it up a bit more. It feels a little bit more sort of childlike. But it's a really great shot, Najib, and I don't want to think, you know, I'm having a go at you in any way. It's just my opinion. But have a little think about this, because composition is, of course, one of those big things. Just a little tilt upwards of the camera, put a bit more sky in it, I think, has helped a bit. I really like this idea as well, Samuel, but I had to look at it for a little while before the penny kind of dropped as to quite what was going on because there's that shadowy figure going on there in the headlights. And I really love it as, you know, walking down the street at night. But again, I would say if you were to just increase that exposure just a tiny bit, you can just see that person. And I kind of love the softness of the whole thing. I just think it's got a really lovely feel about it. Delores is just saying Bigfoot. <laughs> I get where you're going. But I still think it is a great shot because it's got a real mood and an atmosphere to it. Just because something isn't completely sharp doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, wicked or wrong. It just means that the photographer wanted it to be that way. And it's a great way to bring about some feeling, some mood, and some, you know, atmosphere to something. Talking about feelings, I love this one from Debbie Murray because it is, it's just fun, isn't it? It's a great sort of documentary photograph which just captures a feeling of being out in England in the mud. But what I love is the happiness of everything that's going on. I think it's absolutely splendid great fun um, I'm just reading the comments you met this family negotiating the mud and asked if you could snap them I think that's really cool I love the fact they still think it's all a great laugh my only thing is Debbie it's not quite sharp and I don't think it's just a Facebook thing where sometimes the uploads look a bit weird it looks like you've got a little bit of camera shake going on maybe you were laughing a lot too but it's an interesting one Keep an eye on that shutter speed while you're shooting and you probably would have got it all nice and sharp. Now because we are cutting the feedback short a bit and because there was so much incredible creative input going on, I've kind of cut back on the coaching end a little bit because I would really like to just sort of flick through some of the amazing pictures which... I would love you to have been in, we well were in my winner's folder and then slowly I have to just keep going and going and going and there will be until I'm left with just six pictures which I just keep coming back to. So I'm sorry you guys didn't go further but I just want to give you a shout out because I really love these pictures. Paul Lynn. I think this is just a great moment on a, on a walk. It's, it's, it's like a color version of an old 1930s documentary picture. But everything's great. Look at Dad, the way he's standing with such love and adoration. Not only running through his expression, but his body language. And how the little kid is looking at you. And I just love the fact that they've stopped by a stop sign. Um, I just think it is a really lovely bit of photography nice nice one and it does capture that spirit of going for a walk because of course remember we had some lovely pictures but this one was about capturing the spirit of going for a walk rather than the nice things you see on a walk so well done lovely shot I thought this was a really great creative idea from Emma Rawls too um, which just goes to show you don't necessarily have to go out for a walk to capture the spirit of walk this is the thing that's so cool, isn't it, about photography. It is just amazing. I think you've done a really great job there, Emma. 
and I would love to know, I don't know if you're here, but I'd love to know whether or not um, is one you kind of set up or, or whether the child was kind of, I don't know if it's your daughter or son or whatever, whether they were just kind of, you know, playing, whether that's what they were doing and you just captured it. I think it's a really nice shot. Let's move on. Not a very creative idea, which I hadn't thought of with Walk from Phil Saunders Hall about walking on eggshells. I think it's a great idea. Personally, I'm not sure if it wouldn't have been better if you had bare feet for this shot. I don't know. It's just a feeling. What do you think, guys? Boots or bare feet? Oh, here goes. Here comes Emma. We do lots of walking, so we want to try something different. Girls' homework from school. Brilliant. Great, great job, Emma. Boots or bare feet? Boots or bare feet? Hello, George. I haven't been saying to people, hello, Jules Vids and Janet Cooper and, and Clive Barton and Glyn Haskins. Okay. Well, it seems that, yeah, the audience is actually seems to be more heading for the boots thing. So there we go. This is the whole great thing, isn't it? Um, nonetheless, walking on eggshells. We totally, totally get it. And I love it. Forgive me, I keep looking away because I'm checking on the time because I want to make sure. I'm ready. Now this is one of those shots which I don't know why but it's still kept coming back into the shortlist shout outs because this is a kind of pretty scene on a walk but for some reason J. Doug Humphreys I kind of get it. It's like I am standing there. I am feeling that cold and I, and I really like how you've been so brave in just putting the sun right at the top of the frame and somehow for me, it did capture the spirit of going for a walk on a really cold, frosty day. Um, and I mean, it's amazing. Look at that ice. It's just amazing, isn't it? But the thing is, somehow, for me, you did capture that feeling. And I just did want to give you a shout out for that. As with Paul Trivley. Um, yeah, Paul and I have met and I kind of know Paul's pretty good at this stuff. But I just think it's 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 another great one, and I totally get what you said in your comments. You only wish the other foot had been in there, and I do agree, it would have brought a whole other dimension to it. <coughs> but nonetheless, that's not an easy shot to take, and it does capture a feeling or a spirit of going for a walk and splashing through those puddles. I think it's been marvellous. And this one here from Beverly Divine, I think this was a really cracking shot I kind of like the way you've been really brave in your composition and in your exposure I love the way you've used your exposure as part of your composition and just let the pavement burn out just let it go let it be high key I think it's really great and you've got to capture a really great moment too because it's like these two are almost mirrored and it's just such good fun isn't it to me I think that really did capture a spirit and a feeling of walk very very well Linda O'Neill this is just a real great classic winter landscape isn't it and it does have that feeling of being lonely I love the way you kind of allowed space to creep into your picture I think it's um, very well done. Hey, you've got your human sat down, juxtaposed against the tree. You've also got some really gorgeous light going on there. And maybe the choice of black and white, I think, was absolutely right. It just sort of holds together really beautifully. Very creative idea from Lisa Rennie. <laughs> I love the way you put the PLD on there. But again, it's just you know, children walking around the block, you know, walk around the block, we've got PLD, we've got some multiple exposures, I think it is, or maybe some multiple flashes. But again, the, all of these just to me show such incredible creative thinking. Yes, camera technique is a really important part of photography, but that's just learning to drive the car. It's you who does the driving, it's you who thinks your way through and navigates these things. And, you know, when you think how minimal 
the 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 brief I gave you was in that video where I just did some appalling pictures of my feet and said, see if you can capture the spirit of a walk. And look what you have done with that idea. That's what PLD is all about. Photography is all about bringing your creativity out into the open and giving it a workout just like Joss did here because doesn't that ever give you the feeling of being out for a walk in a blizzard it's just magic you guys have just nailed it so well on this I was genuinely quite right because because the thought let's try to do a more minimalist thing and not give people too many ideas and I wasn't sure what would happen but it's just worked great job Joss I think it's such a lovely shot Judith Stewart I really like this too. It's one of those rare moments where kind of the back view seems to work really well. I love the, the crossing and all the people going in different directions. And I totally get it from your street signs. You know, walk. Do you have those in Brisbane? Are you here, Judith? Are you up really early in the morning? I'm not sure. Do you have the walk sign just like they do in the US? But... Uh, I love it. I just think it's captured a spirit beautifully well. This one just looks so classical from Russell Blackburn. I love it because I can feel the mist, but I can also feel that tiny little bit of sunshine trying to burn through it on the lady's face and the trees in the background. It, it's, it's kind of very much like where I live. I haven't read the notes. I'm just wondering because a few of you guys have been putting things up from around where I live. Why are you here, Russell? Be interested to know where it is. But I do think it's a it's a really nice interpretation and feeling of walk. Misty, atmospheric, and all that good stuff. Another lovely <laughs> moment here. How many times have we always been in this place, you know? I just love it, the way the dog is just taking these two guys on as they're walking down the street. Wonderful little bit of street photography there, Kevin Farrell. <clears throat> I think it looks looks smashing. I kind of really get that feeling. It's nicely composed. Everything is beautifully straight and upright. You captured that moment just right. The people are backlit. And that just works well, so that the side we're seeing is in its own shadow, so it's nice and smooth. Ah, thanks Yvonne, Russell lives in my hometown, that's interesting. And if you're here, Russell, if you're not, why not? <laughs> but it's a great shot, and in fact now you say that and I look at that picture more closely, yes, I wonder where that is. Is that my hometown? I don't think so, they don't park that way against the curb. But anyway, so what? Hi Russ. <laughs> right let's move on forgive me I know I sound flustered it's because I'm keeping an eye on that clock and on my screen I thought this was a great interpretation as well of walk what fun to do a picture of a pigeon striding out like that I think that is a cracking idea to get down on the ground and to do that so, what you can't see is on my screen, Estra Suarez has just shown up and come back. He's, he's pulling a little face and he's doing a little diggly thing like that. So I'm going to move on to our runners-up and our winners because we want to hear wifey Suarez. So, let's have a look at our runners-up. I think this was a great shot from Lindy Beaton that just is so cool you've got so many gorgeous lines going on across that with that zigzag running up the middle and the people walking down it how can you not admire that I also think you're really brave with your composition to cut their heads off and really make you concentrate on that whole feeling of walk there's some gorgeous light just tumbling down those steps it is a cracking shot nicely done well done Lindy. David Hartwick. What a beautiful... Now, now huh, I wish I could show this to Astros. I'm going to have to do it another time. The system doesn't allow me to share things, and, and neither of us are very techy. So. Um, but this is a bit of Astros, really. A reflection in a puddle. 
but you've done it so so well and I kind of like the way you've inverted it you've really got the feeling of going for a walk on a rainy day and you've done it very well indeed you haven't been tempted to play around too much with anything and just allowed it to be a little bit dark and a bit dull and a bit gray and I love that reflection of the umbrella going on there how about Sarah Moore congratulations I think it's a cracking picture of these two little kids walking out in what to them is such long grass and I love the way the one on the left giving the one on the right a poke with a stick <laughs> you don't need to see their faces to know what fun is going on um, you've really caught a great spirit of walk there and I like the way they've both got sticks, you know, somewhere they've seen someone walking with poles or sticks or something, and they kind of got excited. They're such little kids. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. Now, I don't know whether I like you or not, Steve Jones, because you took my idea that I demonstrated in that video, and you did it properly. <laughs> so I just had to put you in as a runner-up, because I think you did it really, really well. We've all been there, you know, that moment when you're looking down at your feet as you're splashing through a puddle. Um, you really did capture this one. Absolutely bang on. Congratulations, Steve. Nice shot. Now, the last of our runners-up is Rupert Selden. I just think you caught such a great moment here. I love the way you're down so low and the dog is just coming up right up to the camera to investigate you and the, the the dog lead leading back to the guy and you've caught the perfect moment as that sun is just captured between the tree and the guy with his dog and it's all autumnal and, and leaves and wintry and bare trees i really do i really like this shot it's got a lot of power it's got a lot of dynamism technically of course it's all perfect i like the fact there's almost a little bit of movement in the dog too because you can feel that dog pulling on that lead so congratulations to all of you guys all of you runners up don't forget to get in touch with emma because uh she will sort out whatever your winnings are and also remember that a lot of you have been being incredibly generous because obviously those of you who are more advanced don't necessarily need to win a place on one of my courses or a webinar and you've been incredibly brilliant in sharing your prizes and donating them to other people so just get in touch with emma send send her a message and we will deal with that so now let's have a look at our pld walk winner for this time and for me it's someone we have heard from before but to me we just had to go with it i just think it is such a lovely picture congratulations stephen swain you really caught that whole feeling of walk and you didn't even step outdoors. I love the pastel colours and the way you've been brave enough to focus on the window to capture, you know, what is going on from the inside. You've got the little raindrop sharp and in focus and you've let the person outside go soft. Look at the way you caught the legs. Everything is just right and they're framed across the street by the window so congratulations Stephen you are this week's photography locked down PLD walk challenge winner congratulations to all of you your photography was totally amazing um, what more can I say other than to say estrus turn your microphone on we're ready to rock my friend and I would like to introduce oh, all of no. you rock and roll I knew something like that would happen. I would love to introduce you all to my friend and colleague, Estra Suarez, who is one of the world's good guys, multiple Pulitzer Award-winning photographer, RFK Award-winning photographer. You have done shoots for National Geographic and been all over the world. So I'm going to hand it over to you because you were going to give us a little talk. Hello, Mikey, Mikey. No, Why How are you doing? I'm good, my friend. Estrus, can you turn your mic down a little bit? It's coming over incredibly okay. loud for me. I don't know about you guys. Tell us in the chat. Is Estrus a little bit loud? Well, he is loud. We know that. It's just Estrus. But you're getting a lot I of high Estrus me. comments coming up, mate. You're getting a lot of people say hello. Yeah, <laughs> lots of people are saying it is very loud. If you can turn your volume down on your system. Uh, I did. Is that better? 
It's a no. bit better. Can you go a bit further? Let me see. Uh, maybe we can do it here. It wasn't Hold as loud as it was earlier. It's louder than it was earlier. <clears throat> uh, better? I can try to quiet yeah. it down. No, that is a lot better, I think. How's it coming out your end, guys, out there in YouTube land? Is it, is a bit it better, better, guys? A few people are saying better, yeah. It says a bit loud, but it's... Echo, 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 echo. Are you getting an echo? No, I'm, no, I'm messing, messing with you, you, you. Thanks, 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 thanks. <laughs> nice if you can take the sound down a bit more, I don't know if you're on your system, on your volume. It is still coming out pretty loud. Sorry, guys. No, there isn't an echo. That's that Estrus just fooling with it. It doesn't seem to be making any difference. Let me see. Is that better? That's very loud. Stop it. Let me see if I can take the volume level down a bit from my end. Speak to me, Estrus. Speak to you. Speak to you. I think that's a bit better. I think that is a bit better. <clears throat> I might be a bit quiet, so I'll speak up. Anyway. Let me hand it over to you, Estrus. What do you want to talk to us about? I'm going to disappear down into the corner and just let you get on with it. So please welcome Estrus okay. Suarez. So um, first of all, thank you, Mike, for the opportunity. It's always fun to talk to your people. I hope I'm not blowing anyone's eardrums out. I am going to try to quiet down. If you've ever hear me, heard me speak, you know that I'm not big at quieting things down. I'm full of energy, and as I get talking about photos, I get all excited. So I will do my best because the technical guy on the other end of the, of the big pond is as good technically as I am. And that is just not a good combination. So anyhow, uh, today, uh, Mike, asked, he called me last minute, but it's Mikey and I love him. So whatever he wants is good. And he, you know, we came up with a title for, so the thinking behind the photos, I actually, I want you to think about that. If you do, Get rid of the S at the end of photos. And what I want you to get out of this whole thing is how I approach a situation, how I, I decide, okay, I, I'm going to place myself in this spot because of this and this and this. So basically, the thinking behind the photo. The order in which I put the, this array of photos, it kind of makes sense to me. That does, I don't know if that's going to make sense to you, but there is some sort of a progression to it. So let me start by sharing my screen. I can see Mike now. I, hopefully, you can see my stuff. Is that a yes, Mike? Yes, all yeah, right. Yeah, I can see your screen. Now I can see my grid. Yes. And here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So, the thinking behind the photos. Like I said, I thought about it afterwards, and we should have gotten rid of the S because it really applies to everything and anything. So, what I'm first going to show you is something that is very dear to my heart, which is the place where I learned how to photograph about 25 years ago. I remember back in the day when I had this, this would have been my third internship with the Rocky Man News. Uh, it turned out to be with a newspaper called the Rocky Man News. And, um, it, you know, I wanted to go big. I wanted to see the world, but that paper was not about that at the time. So I remember my boss telling me, you need to give yourself the assignment you want someone else to give you. And I thought long and hard about it, and I came up with, well, you know what I like? I like watching people. I like just walking around and documenting stuff. And that hasn't changed much. So what you're looking at here is this uh, very small neighborhood that I decided to just simply document. Uh, I did this for about two years. Every time I would have time off, I would just go to this neighbor and just walk around. This is where I learned how to see. This is where I learned how to understand light. And this is where I started perceiving decisive moments. In this case, you know, um, this is just a house that rented rooms, but this sign had been there so long that the tree grew around it. So this is kind of a chaotic scene. And how do how do I how do you decide what is the best way to showcase this? This is a theme that you're going to see throughout my photography show up often. To me, one of the most important things besides the storytelling aspect of it is for you to immediately be able to recognize what's going on in the image. And that also means having a clean background. So the easiest way to have a clean background is pointing up at the sky. You don't really need to see the whole house here in order to see that this is a sign that says rooms in front of the house. Uh, this is, again, it's one of my favorite photos ever. And this was made with um, back in the day when I didn't use zoom lenses, but instead I actually used 
uh, prime. So I'm pretty sure this was done with a 180 2.8. The focusing ring was this tiny, tiny, thin, very ring. Out of focus wasn't that good. So I wouldn't be surprised if I've actually manually focused this. But what I want you to think, what I want you to take out of this photo, is, this is a, nonetheless, this is an amazing universal little moment, a decisive moment. You got three kids running, they're wearing costumes, it's Halloween. I see them coming my way and, uh, and I start shooting. And in the middle of all of that, the, the guy, the kid on the right, he loses his cape and the cape falls to the ground. And I happen to capture that moment where his foot is not quite touching the cape his body language, his body's turned back. The other kid is about to look down. A lot of it is serendipity. A lot of it is luck. But this kind of things don't happen unless you happen to be at the right place, at the right moment, with the right gear, with the right settings. So the only thing that I actually had control over here was do I wait for them to get up close to me and do this with a wide-angle lens, or do I use a telephoto? I understood the optics of a telephoto well enough to know that I needed separation. So... I shot this with a telephoto and the thinking behind it for me was I'm going to get low enough so I create an interesting angle. And when it comes to photographing children and pets and people sitting down, you always want to be at least eye level with them. Uh, this is more about light. Mistress, can I interrupt just a moment? So how far into your photography career would you say you were when you did that shot? Uh, I would say professionally maybe a year and a half kind of tingling or messing around with photography maybe about three years into my career that, that, mind you this this is why i said there's a lot of luck and serendipity into this shot this yeah, is a there, great shot that i go ahead yeah yeah there is and also i mean just to put a bit of background for some of the guys listening who may not know you didn't train as a photographer did you um i actually didn't pick up I, yeah, no, not at all. I, I didn't pick up a camera for many, many years. I actually kind of fell by mistake, uh, by accident, into photography. I was studying to be a writer, a uh, journalist, and it's just things worked out that, you know, I was suggested, why don't you switch to photography? And I happened to have had a, an eye that I needed to develop and learn. I, I'm, I would say I'm not an innately good photographer. I am only as good as I am because I have learned from a lot of great people. I have made every mistake there is to be made in the book, and I have learned from those mistakes. So never, ever be afraid of failing because failures will always give you lessons to learn from. That is if you're smart. If you're dumb, you're just going to keep making the same lesson over and same mistake over and over. <laughs> No, absolutely. By the way, guys, anyone here? Oh, somebody just asked, were you using burst mode in, in the kids in capes? Picture? Yes. Always. When I learned from a very young age in photography that when it comes to people, people move extremely fast within that tiny frame. And the difference between an a okay photo, a good photo, and a great photo may be tiny, tiny spaces. For example, look at this photo and notice how the back foot of the kid running in the foreground, it's not touching the cape. If there were not that space there, the photo wouldn't work. You wouldn't know what the heck is going on there. But now you can tell, oh, something fell and it's on the ground. So I wouldn't have been able to capture that if I would have been in single. There's just too many elements going on here for me to have pulled it off. Even nowadays that I'm much more adroit at managing my gear. You know, why would I want to shoot single when the camera has a capacity of shooting 10, 10 12 frames a second? That makes no sense. Mm, yeah, got um, it. Got it. By the way, if anyone else wants to ask questions, while Estrus is talking, I'm just watching the screen here. And if, if anyone asks something, I, I will pass it over. I'll ask it on your behalf. And I actually want you to ask questions. I don't mind being interrupted. I think if you interrupt me, that means you're paying attention. So please don't let me talk for long periods of time without asking something, because then I, I think I'm boring you guys. <laughs> okay, so this photo, it's about rule of thirds. Uh, so it's about the composition, but it's mostly about the light. And this is what I told you, that this is the neighborhood. This is the place where I learned to understand light. And, you know, at first I thought I was going to have silhouettes of this mother and kid walking until the kid happened to turn on the light, hit him right in the face. So the choice here was for me, I could have gone low, but then I wouldn't have gotten a clean background. The, the woman's head probably would have touched the windows or the kids or something. So these are decisions that you make on the fly. And um, my shooting mantra is keep shooting, keep moving, keep adjusting. Keep shooting, keep moving, keep adjusting. I didn't know that's what I do. 
all the time until I started analyzing the way I shoot. And I am not a stationary shooter. I, especially when it comes to street photography, I am all over the place. And to me, street photography is pretty much all I do, either by being by being a storyteller, doing a, a, sto- a specific story, or by documenting a place, or people, or even by covering news. I am actually just trying to adapt to the scene. Uh, same thing, walking around, turning. Uh, there's there's sometimes there's no need to get fancy. All you do is you just put yourself in the right place. You get rid of all the extemporaneous things that don't add to the photo. So in this case, all I did is I saw this person looking out the window, and all I did was I got close enough where I could actually fill the frame with the curtains and the glass and the face and the little figurine. So the point on this one is my thinking is why reinvent the wheel? I didn't need to frame this by anything. This was amazing as it was. So sometimes you just go with what's there. You have to assess every situation by its own merit, by, by its own content. This again, my little amazing little neighborhood. I am way overdue, by the way, to put a book on this neighborhood. I have I have a stack about this big of, co- of color negatives that I need to go through. Um, there's, I'm sure they're just jewels. They're waiting to be had. So I, mean, I owe myself. Something there, Esther. The what? Somebody... Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure if anyone else can. I'll, I'll just change something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it works. <clears throat> Somebody was just saying in the comments that they still shoot film and burst mode is expensive. It is. So it's kind of interesting. It is. So when you were shooting this stuff and you were shooting with film, are you still using burst mode? Well, let me put it this way. I was more selective when I was going to let it go. Because even though my cameras are always in continuous high, I have enough control of the amount of pressure I put in the finger where I know I'm going to shoot click, 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 or it's going to go. <laughs> so you, you become so familiar with your gear that you have that control. So yes, I was shot in continuous mode even when I was shooting film because a situation like that, I'd rather run out of film than to have missed it because I was doing one click at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm better I mean, at that. But, yeah. And shooting on film, it kind of teaches you to think about what you're doing a bit as well, doesn't it? Because, you know, you're going to run out yep. of 36 frames pretty quickly. And when 36 of those frames cost you, as it did back in the day, what, 10 pounds to get those developed and printed, it kind of makes you think about what you're doing a bit more. Yeah. I actually think that anybody that learned to shoot on film first, it's ahead of the curve because you needed to rely on knowledge and practice to to actually get what you're going to get nowadays digital allows us the luxury of knowing it immediately how you messed up and you get to fix it so i i count my blessings on having learned on film uh this photo right here is it, just a scene that i found and i thought it was very heartwarming the guy on the right is the, is the pastor of a of the neighborhood church the guy on the left is just a parishioner that every Sunday before service, he'd actually, in his suit, get down on the ground and pull all the weeds from the fence. Mm. So I just happened to capture a beautiful moment. The, the only control that I had here is how high do I make, how, how, where do I position myself in order to get the best photo? Like I said, a uh, long time ago, I learned that the best way to photograph people that are low is you got to be at least eye level with them. And, you know, this is a moment moments decisive moments rule the scene they rule the photo you might have bad technique bad composition bad everything but if there's a powerful decisive moment within that frame your photo is going to rock Esther, somebody annette vorm has just asked what are your best tips for storytelling in a single frame and i'm guessing that as we go through you're going to start pulling up some of your more let's say well-known images and talking a bit about those stories but and, and it was yeah. just saying, yeah, what is your best tips for storytelling in a single frame? Because I know some of the stories in well, some of your single so frames. So I do this. I do that a lot, you know. So first of all, I come from a background where I was taught that your photos need to speak in a, uh, in a, they need to tell the story visually in a vacuum of information. So what it means, what the, that means is you might not know who these people are. You might not know that's a church on the right. You might not know that's a, that's a priest and that's a parishioner, but it doesn't really matter. That interaction going on between these two humans, it's universal. So I am telling you the story of the moment. So every time I look at a situation, I observe 
I watch, I pay attention, and I try to predict what could happen next. That's a good tip. Observe, watch, pay attention, and predict. And put yourself in the best possible position. So, for example, if two people are about to hug, they haven't seen each other in a while, and you, you, you kind of see them come, you need to put yourself in a place where behind them, it's a clean background, and you got to shoot it fast, because this is how fast people hug. <laughs> Yeah. That, was, that was about seven frames. And the best photo is this one right here, where they were about to meet. We're about to meet. Right. Um, same thing. Look at this. This is a backyard picnic volleyball. One of the few, quote unquote, sports photos that I have where there's not a ball or a puck in it. Um, Esther, can and, I interrupt uh, briefly? Someone called Janet yeah, Cooper yeah. is obviously really interested because she's asked a couple of times, why were you there? When the, when the Thank guy you, was Janet. pulling the weeds. Well, that's that's what I was telling you about. This is the neighborhood. This is That was my assignment that I gave myself. Every single period of spaces of time, windows of time, of free time that I had, I would go to this neighborhood just to make photos. So I, they were all used to me by then because I was there all the time. Uh, my poor wife spent a lot of uh, lonely Sundays, uh, weekends, just because, for example, that was on a Sunday morning. So even in my days off, I would just take off because I had given myself the assignment I wanted someone else to give me. I wanted someone else to give me an assignment saying, document uh, life in this neighborhood. So I did it. I gave it to myself. I made it a point to, this was a, pro a project that was had a lot of value to me. So I wanted to be there. And this is a really great tip for any of you guys who, who kind of want to look more at this genre. The only way you get good at something is by practicing it. So, you know, kind of like, what we're hearing here is the evolution of a photographer who's climbed to the very top of the tree in his profession. And it's like, this is the upward journey. This is the little home projects, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You know, you set these projects for you. Yeah. And uh, like I said, the bottom line is a good photo is a good photo, no matter what the subject is. This is as mundane as it gets. People enjoying a weekend picnic. And I, as a photographer, a storyteller, I want to tell you the best in the best possible world that I know this tiny story, this interaction going on. So obviously what I did here that made the photo work was as they were moving, I was moving with them. So as the guy in the right move in, I actually got right up there to the to the net and I created that beautiful diagonal yellow line. It's that's that's what is known as an entry point. It gives the it gives the photo a three-dimensional perspective. All this all these photos that I made in this neighborhood that have no deadline, that that I never knew whether they're gonna be published or not, they taught me all the things that I needed to know when I was covering news. So nowadays you send me to a news assignment, you can be pretty sure that I'm if it happens within my field of vision, it's very likely that I'm not going to miss it. Not because I am Superman. It's just because I have missed so many other things before. And little by little, I've gotten better at it. So practice, practice, practice. It goes right back to what Mike just said. Something I just and I think to throw in, mm -hmm. throw in here for you, Estrus. Um, so there's quite a lot of people asking about... Uh, do you need, you know, copyright permission, getting a release signed or anything like that? And the other one, which I totally agree with, was uh, Stig just said, you know, be honest, Mike, if you were critiquing his photo, you would have said it's a shame about that black bin liner. <laughs> black bin liner. Oh, <laughs> behind yeah. Behind the lady. But, behind the lady. Yeah. yeah. And Sorry, to somebody's, the, uh, to... somebody's, somebody's taking the you know what, mate. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's but yeah, but, the but copyright stick, permission, go, there's a lot of people are very confused about this one. They're, they're always saying, well, can I do straight Okay, so this is how it goes. It, and... So it depends on what country you live in, because it varies from country to country. In the United States, uh, the law says if it's happening in a public place and you can see it with a naked eye, the persons, the people have no expectation of privacy. So what you see with your eyes, you can document with a photographic device. Okay. Now, I am in someone's backyard here. They gave me permission to be there. I, I, I create a rapport with them, and I built a relationship, and that, therefore they invited me into a place. So they, they knew I was making photos. Now, if I were to publish this, I, would, I don't know. I, uh, I, would, I would have to look into that, but I don't think it would be a problem. I would just, I literally would just fly back to Denver, go back to the neighborhood, and ask around, and just tell people that I'm doing this, and I bet you it would be okay. 
because this is a celebration of a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to Stig. Stig, I know you're kidding about the, the black bag behind the ladies because I caught her in mid fall and I caught the body language of the guy on the other side. It boils down to this. If you have a powerful, decisive moment within the frame, clean backgrounds are not that important. Good composition is not that important. I completely get it. Uh, nowadays, I try to avoid this kind of things, but when things are happening this fast, there is no way you're going to get all everything lined up. Sometimes it happens, but most of the time it doesn't happen. All right. Uh, kid getting a haircut outside of a home in the neighborhood. This is just about what this goes back to fill in the frame. My thinking was, I don't need anything else. I mean, mind you, when I come to a scene, first thing I do is I, I start shooting with my wide angle because I want to get an encompassing overall view of everything. And then I start picking specific photos within photos. I'm pretty sure the original photo that I started the sequence was more of the, you could see the whole torso of the kid and maybe the guy on the right, the guy giving him, give him a haircut. But eventually I realized, no, 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 no. The photo here is the hand, the face, the scissors. That's the photo. So sometimes you just got to go closer, 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 closer. Uh, the black frame means we're switching, yes, to my more famous photos. Um, this is the photo of the RFK we were talking about. This the is RF, uh, the RFK, in case you don't know, guys, RFK is the Robert F. Kennedy Award. And if you want to explain more about what it is, Estrus. Okay, so there are, there are less RFKs than there are Pulitzers. I have two of the Pulitzers and I have one RFK. Within my, within my field, within photojournalism, there are less RFKs than Pulitzers. But the Pulitzer has much more of a broad appeal. People know more about it. But anybody within my, my little world of photojournal, photojournalism here in the States will know that an RFK is something, it's quite impressive. So, and I, I love Mike because I told Mike once only that about the RFK being uh, harder to get. There are less of them and I have the Pulitzer's and everybody knows. And Mike has always made it a point from then on to say, not only say two time Pulitzer Prize, but he's also an RFK guy. So love you, Mike. Mm -hmm. love um, you too. So anyhow, <laughs> this is uh this is part of a whole essay that I did. It was called Osveli's Journey. Osveli was, is the child, the 14-year-old child inside a casket. And uh, this kid was actually killed in a traffic accident, in a car accident. He was in the back of a van being smuggled in the U.S. in a back road of Colorado. The guy that had been, the guy driving the coyote, the transportation guy, was had been driving for like 15 hours straight. He was exhausted. Middle of nowhere, they're avoiding highways. There's this little straight arrow of a road, and all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, it just fears right. And the guy completely missed it. He was exhausted, so he just kept going straight. The van overturned. There were 17 people inside this van. Two of them died. Uh, and when we heard about the accident, my bosses wanted to know, who are these people that are willing to risk their lives to come to the U.S.? The interesting thing is this happened 25 years ago, uh, 20, 20 years ago, and this story is still as relevant now this as it was 20 years ago people are always looking for a better future they move from place to place uh, different country different area it's the same thing it's the same thing um the the thinking behind this photo is when i first walked into the scene which is the moment where you know they place a casket and the whole village comes in and everybody's around the casket i walk into the scene and the first thing i want to do is not to be noticed I, this is so private. This is such an intimate, painful moment for the family of the kid that I didn't want to push my way to the, to the front because that was not my right. I was, I, you know, I felt lucky just to be a witness from the back of the room. But because I was someone from the outside that thought this was important enough to be told, the people in the village, they themselves kind of grabbed my arm and they brought me right up to the casket. And that's where I was working at eye level with them. Um, from the right of the casket and uh, it was an honor to to be allowed into the scene and to be able to document such a painful moment so again this uh, this the many other photos that I took and all those moments where there was no deadline there was not a, a, a spot news event something some news happening right there and then they needed a photo is the kind of stuff that prepared me to be able to get photos like this in a situation that is very delicate. And as a matter of fact, this was the very first time in my professional career where I, when I took a photo, I immediately knew this photo is transcendental. This photo 
is way beyond anything that I've ever made before. This photo is going to have a lot of impact. Like I just knew it. The moment I looked through my camera, through my viewfinder, and I saw the scene, I just knew like this is very important. So, all right, I'm going to move to the next. Unless there are any questions about this one. Has anyone got any questions on that one? Please feel free to ask. I mean, I while well, we just wait for people to maybe tap a few in if they have. <clears throat> I mean, I know the backstory, more of the backstory to this picture, because Estrus has told me before, you know, about how you were following this this casket and these two boys for several days up into the mountains. And not only was it a long trek, you were sick, you were unwell. Um, yeah. And it's all these sorts of things. It's about, am I right in suggesting that it's who you are being as a human being as well? So you're kind of being unstoppable because you're ill. You are exhausted. You are still following this procession up into the mountains. But then also, there has to be something about who you are being, not in what you're doing, as in something human which engenders the trust of these people in such an intimate moment to want to grab you and, and, and say, come and tell our story? Well, I am a true believer that it doesn't really matter what your background is. And I mean, culturally, geographically, religious, uh, racially, it doesn't really matter. People at a gut level, they can feel whether you're there because you're honestly interested in what's going on and that you're feeling what they're feeling. I am, I'm a marshmallow. Look, I, you know, you put me in a situation like this, I'm basically shooting through tears because I can feel the pain of the mother who's the one, the one touching the casket and the grandmother is the one that is kind of looking up. And I can, I, can, I can feel the pain these people are feeling and I am extremely sad myself. But I also know that I'm there to do a job and that is to document the end of the life of a kid that, you know, thought that he would have a better life in the US and instead he ends up dying. In a car accident so yeah i really i really think that it, when you are in a situation like this your humanity needs to be at, at the top of your behavior i don't think in those terms uh, unless you ask me about it but one of the things that i'm always very careful about is i try to be respectful of people and of the situation it uh, i always try to think god if that were my boy in that casket and some yay who walks in with a camera how would i feel so those things do cross my mind, and I always try to be respectful. Sometimes I'd rather miss a photo than to actually push my way through a grieving crowd to get that shot. It's just not worth it. Those things are just bad spots in your karmic aura. I don't, homie, don't play that. I don't like that. All right, I'm going to go to the next, okay? <clears throat> Someone did ask, did you feel awkward taking this shot? But I think you uh, no. answered it, really. No, I didn't feel awkward because uh, they welcomed me in. Uh, it was a very painful situation, and but they wanted me there, and they kind of understood somebody from the, uh, the big north has come to document the life of our little Osvili. So no, I didn't feel awkward at that moment. When I first walked to the village, I didn't know what to expect, but they pretty quickly kind of made me understand that, understand that I was welcome. Mm -hmm. um, this is a story, this is just a regular everyday story. I was doing a, a story on wild horses in Nevada, and I spent some time at a ranch, a cattle ranch, and I was just documenting daily life in a cattle ranch. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this cow, I'm looking at this cowboy, and, and I'm paying attention to the cowboy. The cowboy pulls out a, a knife. I don't know what he's going to do with the knife. He goes to a cow, and he, you know, I still don't know what he's going to do. And he just grabs the ear and cuts a bit of it. I'm like, whoa, what the heck just happened there? They're marking him for identification. But to me, that was such a shocking thing. I missed it. I missed the moment of cutting. But then I'm like, how can I best tell the impact this thing has done on me? And I hope I can transfer that to the person looking at the at the photo. And you know, and I just went for the eye because the eye, it might be an animal, but to me, the eye is still the window to the soul. So as a matter of fact, look at this. I could have chosen to focus on the blood, but I didn't. I chose to focus on the eye because I kind of knew that it would be bright enough. But this is about. I'm just telling you what went through my mind when the photos are being made. I, and I'm sorry, this is a harsh photo, but this is reality. You know, the fact that we're not aware of how cows are branded or whatever, it doesn't mean that doesn't happen. So, all right, next photo. Okay, this is this is a seldom seen photo because I don't think this is a great photo, but it's a, it's a photo that tells a story. 
it's a it's a so we were i was hanging out with the cops and they were it was a drug raid they had set up a sting situation where they had a fake dealer and then the people that would come and and buy once they bought they actually got busted and uh, i follow this guy into the whole process of being arrested being booked and then they put him inside <laughs> the jail room and this is the moment where it kind of hits him and what bad of a spot he is. So, and, and, and I didn't really put much thought into the matter other than my eyes are glued to this guy's behavior. And at that point I had such great uh, rapport with the officers, with the police, that they let me pretty much be. So I actually was just there right on, above their shoulders shooting as much as I could. So in a situation like this, you just try to be as accurate depicting reality as you can. So this is the moment where the guy just realized, oh my God, am I in trouble? So go yeah. on to the next. Um, a chap called Bob Boeing has just asked, Astros, did you have an idea of what genre you wanted to do when you first started out in photography? No, and to this day, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a specialist. I am a generalist. Um, for example, um, I am, so I am a, a Nikon Z, uh, seven and Z6 uh, social media influencers for Latin America. Okay, this means that they they're giving me equipment that I'm supposed to promote, and uh, and so one of the things they're giving me with a new camera, it's a it's a it's a portrait lens. I don't even remember what it is, but it's a 1.8. That means that for for the next coming months, I'm going to start focusing more portraits, and it doesn't take me anything to simply shift from one thing to the other because a lot of times. I find everything and anything in front of me interesting, interesting enough to actually make a photo. So it does. I'm. It, I yes. I have. I, I'm known as a news photographer because I worked for newspapers for so many years. But what people forget is, in order to be a staff photographer at a publication, you kind of need to become a jack of all trades. Within the staff, we had our specialists. We had people that were very good at doing sports. Very people that were very good at doing. Uh, studio work, people that were very good at doing documentary work. I The way I approached it is, if my name is going to go under that photo, it needs to be good. So I made it a point to try to excel pretty much in any type of photography that I have tried. Uh, but yeah, I'm mostly known as a news photographer, but I still do street photography and travel photography and portraits and, and, and food. And I've been chasing my cat since I got it for the next, last six months. And I do amazing I to, pet photography. So. I need to interrupt at that point because <clears throat> there is a link to Estrus's website in the comments area below this live feed. So when we're done, go check out some of his galleries because, yeah, he does shoot all sorts of things. But having spent time with him what what you need to understand is he doesn't stop shooting things so like last year we were invited we, we we were taken from exposure to a private dinner at some big palace thing by sheikh al kasami al kasimi and you know during dinner estrus has got his camera on the table and every now and then he's like hey that might make an interesting shot from here and he's off and he's walking around and he's shooting all the time all the time all the time I mean, at one point, it's like he said, hey, I wonder if you can get up to that gallery up there. And, and he genuinely did <laughs> climb up onto this gallery and was photographing from above. So what's my I point? I have to talk to security for that one. Yeah, yeah. But, but my point is to get good at something, it is practice. It's a handful of controls on a camera and the rest of it is 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 practice. Would you say that? Would you agree with that one? Oh, very much so to the, you know, people ask me, which is your favorite type of photography and i say i am photography as simple as that it has become such a part of me that i no longer need to think about it until i have my so there's this great zen proverb that goes first there's no mountain then there is a mountain then there's no mountain it took me years to understand what that was about it turns out that has to do with learning and making something part of you when you know nothing, when you don't have all the things that you do not know, there's nothing stopping you from doing an action. So when you start as a photographer, you are happy just making photos of anything and everything. You're a happy camper. Then all of a sudden you start, so there's, there's no mountain stopping you. 
all of a sudden you start realizing all the things that you do not know and you realize what a mountain of knowledge that is and you you realize that you need to get through that in order to learn so but once you learn all of that then all of that sort of disappears and there's no more mountain that stops you because all of that becomes part of who you are so it becomes a reflex it's just like in martial arts you repeat a movement over and over again until you do not think about the movement. I tell people, don't grab me from behind or you're going to get a busted jaw. Not because I mean to do that for you, but because I train so many times. If somebody grabs me, I immediately put him on a, on a joint lock. That's just, that's exactly what you need to do. Something you need to become which, so um, Something which a lot of you guys probably don't know is Estrus is also a yoga teacher and an instructor in several martial arts. So um, look up Viz Yoga, V-I-S Yoga, and check out some of his little videos on Instagram. He's, uh, I did one of his yoga classes a couple of years ago. I couldn't walk for two days. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be quiet because we've got about another 30 minutes, and I know you've got stuff to talk about, Estrus. So, All right. so this one is... Questions. It's okay. This one, it's, it's a classic mine in the sense that it is news happening and I am right smack in the middle of things when the chaos this is one of the first chaotic scenes that I ever walked into very early in my career this is uh, after a tornado went to a trailer park uh, most people in the world they think of Colorado they think of the Rocky Mountains and the beautiful snowscapes but what they don't know is half the state is flat and the big open uh, spaces look just like Kansas which is a state uh, near it and uh, and it's just there's nothing. So a lot of tornadoes out there. So this I got a call that a tornado was hitting the area. I got there maybe uh, 45 minutes, an hour after the fact. And this is a, uh, this is a mother who's actually her son is saying goodbye to her. He was gonna go sleep at some friend's house. Later on, I found out he was a son. I always thought it's kind of very unique the 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 body language going on there. But a, this is a moment of pain. She, they're basic, she's basically going through her life's belongings that are just thrown about. And the ominous clouds in the background just tell you what just went through. So anybody who's familiar with a tornado and you can see the open fields in the back, this store, this photo pretty much captures everything. Big open space, menacing skies, destruction, people suffering. So uh, all I had control of this was to be in the right place at the right moment. So I was kind of walking amidst the debris. I saw the sun coming towards her and I believe I dropped down to my knees too. And so I predicted the shot. And I got the shot. Uh, this is in uh, Turkey, a celebration. I am right at the border with Iraq. Yes. Uh, so this is the, this would be Nerus. Nerus being the New Year's that they celebrate. Um, so the people, the Turkish, no, the, the Kurds, which is northern part of Iraq, southern part of uh, Turkey, they celebrate New Year's Nerus, and there was this an enclosed area where they were celebrating. And uh, the Turkish government lets him do this, but it keeps him in an enclosed area. So I was inside, and this is just uh, chaos. You know, the, the elders are trying to make the kids behave. They're actually under the watchful eye of police and, and the military, but the kids get all riled up. So it's, you, you know, in a situation like this, you just move around. You try to make photos as things are happening. You, do, you need to remain flexible. You need to remain fluid, and you need to watch out for your own safety. So there, there's a lot of things going I, to this day, I cannot tell you whether the fact that I shoot through my left eye, and that is my dominant eye, even though I'm right-handed, and the fact that my right eye, my non-shooting eye, is recessive. Like, I have more than perfect vision in my good eye, and, the, and on my recessive eye, the vi it's not so good. I cannot read certain things if I close my good eye. So that also allows me to have both eyes open. So I actually shoot with both eyes open, and I'm actually always paying attention to peripheral movement happening outside of my field of vision from where I'm, where I'm actually making photos through the viewfinder. So that's just becoming hyper aware of your surroundings. And that was the point of this photo, to show you that you need to pay attention to everything and anything around you. Uh, Estra, uh, Darren case. Sangster has mm -hmm. just asked, as a news photographer, do you ever feel threatened either by the situation at hand, like the weather, or by the people and their emotions? Oh, yes, very much so. Very much so. As a matter of fact, if you go to my website and you go to my galleries and you look at my editorial, the last set of photos that I that I added there were from the Capitol riots on January the 6th. I was there and I could, well, I had covered other Trump-related rallies 
within the last couple of months prior to that. And you can just feel the animosity towards the members of the media. It's off the charts. I have been in the middle of a military coup in Haiti where there are people dying everywhere and there's complete chaos and their bodies everywhere. And I have not felt that degree of hate towards me as a member of the media as I have felt during those Trump rallies. And I'm not saying all the people that went to those rallies were crazies, but there is a very small fringe of extremists that were out there to cause harm, uh, pain, destruction, and just injure whomever they got in the way. So yeah, I could feel it. Um, I, you know, again, you would have to look at my Instagram postings and there's one from January 6th where I'm actually showing you the way I'm dressed. First of all, when you go to a situation like this, you got to think ahead. Um, uh, the, the Trump extreme supporters, they perceive uh, Antifa as their enemy more than anybody else. And allegedly Antifa members dress all in black, tight, black jeans, black hoodies, black helmets, whatever. So you do not dress all in black with a black hoodie da, 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 to cover something like that. So I made it a point that day when I went out there to cover that, how am I going to dress? I had black pants on, but I had a, a, a plaid red shirt and a red uh, vest on top of that. I'm also wearing my bulletproof vest on there. I have my tear gas mask strapped to my leg and I have a, a helmet, a Kevlar helmet on, and I have my cameras on my shoulders. There's no mistake in who I am. And, and then when I feel animosity, there are two ways. There are two ways of dealing with that. You can ignore it, or sometimes you just need to acknowledge it and let people know I'm just not an easy prey. You're going to come and mess with me. You're probably going to beat me down. But before you do that, you're going to get a couple of broken clavicles, a couple of broken kneecaps. I'm just saying. I literally, that is my thinking when I'm in a situation like this. I am not only being super mindful of what's in front of me that I need to photograph, but I'm also, my head is con continuously in the swivel. I'm looking around. And if somebody's looking at me, I can tell. You can tell. It's, from, it's a primal thing when somebody's out to threaten you. You just lock eyes with them. That's it. A lot of times, all the evildoers need is acknowledgement. You acknowledge them, and they, they have to rethink, is this guy worth it? It's, it's the same thing as if you are a, a tourist in, in a faraway land, and you take photos in the middle of the street, and you forget about your surroundings, and you start looking at the back of your photo, and you're standing in the middle of a street where there's traffic, surrounded by, in, by uh, people that you don't know in an area that you don't know. You know what you are? You are walking prey for thieves and burglars, because you are behaving like prey. You're not paying attention to your surroundings. You're not aware of anything. You're so focused on your little apparatus in hand that you don't pay attention. When I'm in a place that I don't know and I'm by myself, I make the photos, I look around, I find a wall, I put my back to the wall, I look around, then I look down. I look down and then I look up. I look down and look up. So you need to be hyper aware of your environment at all times. That's just situational awareness. All right, I'm gonna move on. There's uh, uh, one of your shots, which I'm really hoping you're going to talk about. It's the one you took uh, with the bullets flying up the streets and the little boy. Uh, oh, I don't have that because, one here. Cause I, yeah, yeah. No, I, that's right. I don't, I don't want to bore you. your people. No, no, no. I, I really want. I really look forward to you talking about that because I have a question I want to ask you about managing fear and this sort of thing. But I'm going to wait until you okay, get to that place. Okay. I am not. Um, that photo is not here, but we could always jump to my website and I can pop it up big. So. It's fine. So this is a story in Sudan. I'm just going from point A to point B, documenting daily life uh, for a travel piece. This was one of, one of those more like we go there so you don't have to kind of thing. Like this is the middle of the desert. We cross deserts where inside the car was 87 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's that in centigrade. But outside is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so it, it's a pretty extreme situation. And this is in the middle of nowhere. This is a village uh, near the Nile River in Sudan uh, called Kadabas. And there's a, a wise man there, and men would come in with their problems, and he would pass judgment. W women were not allowed to come into his presence. So women would just come to the, to the windows and kind of look in, and that's what this is. You know? So in a situation like this where I'm trying to tell the story of people of both sexes coming in to have this guy pass judgment, you need to pay attention to what's in front of me, which is going to be the guy talking to a man. But then you got to stop and look to see what's behind you. And this is what I found, a woman looking through the mesh. Uh, Do you want to say any more of the back story of that? Because I, sorry, Estes, I was harvesting questions. You, Cause I know you remember that. that. I totally remember that. And how the guy you were with had said to you, I don't really advise you not to take that. Don't, don't. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. Okay, you don't so talk when about Mike it, is talking about on, man. This looks cool. no, 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 that's fine. So when Mike is talking about, which I don't have the photo here, but I have it. So I was, we were brought in, and we we're watching this. This guy's sitting on the ground, his pillows all around him. There's a, there's a some sort of little cot behind him, and in this cot is something that I couldn't recognize right away what it was. It was kind of a long thing, had a handle and a bunch of things on one end. I don't know what it was, and. Uh, so and the guy's passing judgment da, 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 he's telling he's pointing at people and telling them what the translator is trying not to disrupt and he's in low voice kind of uh, translating what's going on finally one of these women managed to get inside which is completely against tradition and uh, but apparently she had been trying for so long that the sheikh finally said just bring her in so they brought her in she got down to her knees and and the translator's eyes are just big white saucers and I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. And, uh, and uh, so finally, so I'm, I, I do have a couple of frames of her talking to them, to the sheikh. And then the sheikh kind of looks slightly behind him. And I still have my camera up. And, and then the translator kind of puts his hand in front of my camera. And he asked me to lower the camera. He said, you probably don't want to photograph this. And, and the, the sheikh took out what was on the bed, which turned out to be a whip. And he just went to town on that woman. He just started whipping her. You know, the, the writer and I were just frozen in place. And my instinct was, I kept trying to pick up the camera and the, and the translator kept his hand on it. You know, I wasn't going to cause a scene. And afterwards, I asked the guy, like, what the heck was that about? He said, well, believe it or not, the woman kept saying that she had done something that was so evil, she needed to be punished. At first, he gave her something to drink. And I didn't know what's going on, but he actually spat into a cup and he gave it to her and he, she drank it. I thought that would be punishment enough, but apparently it wasn't enough for her. So she asked for more. So she basically begged him to hit her. And, and so he ended up whipping her. So yeah, uh, I couldn't get the photo because somebody had their hand on my camera. Otherwise I would have gotten the photo, but I, that would probably get us kicked out of there too. So. <laughs> and this is a whole That's other just... area of kind of what you do because it's being aware of different cultures and different things because, you know, nobody would have would ever consider that the woman would go in and say, I deserve to be punished. Whip me. Yep. It's it's yep. it's it's, it's, so it's very alien to our way of thinking. But what, what we have to realize as human beings that what is alien to our way of thinking is completely normal to someone else's way of thinking. And it doesn't make them bad, wicked or wrong. It just means that it's different. It means they're different. Right. Um, I, it's very hard. But whenever I'm, I'm taking photos doesn't matter where I am. I try not to pass judgment. I try to see things from their point of view. And uh, that's very hard, you know, because as we grow older, I mean, from the moment we're born to wherever you are in life, you have been exposed to a set of values, customs, and traditions that creates your prejudices. And you tend to judge the world based upon what you know. So, but when you put yourself out there in situations that you don't know anything about the, the culture or the tradition, you really need to be careful what you do. I, it's usually I just go by, you know, when in Rome, do as Romans do kind of stuff. Uh, just follow locals, what they're doing. And I try to ask people, what am I not supposed to do here? What's okay? You know, exercise common sense. I always be respectful. Um, this is just a photo of a funeral in Haiti. Uh, a man who had gotten killed in the middle of a political riot. And he, his body was brought home uh, in a little village. It was like five hours away from Port-au-Prince. And I was in the back of that pickup truck with a casket and the family for five okay. hours. We kept, I, we kept asking him, how long before we get there? Oh, it's just around the corner. It's the yes, day that yes. I learned that distance. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, my friend. Uh, you've Fine. got your cursor right on the guy's nose. I just wonder if you could... Uh... No, I don't. No. That's okay. Well, it was, but uh, that's... Really? Who's... Are you just not the tear? It's not my screen. I, oh, it's funny. Whose screen I... is that? Whose cursor is that? <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's funny. I cannot see it on my screen. Interesting. Okay. okay. Uh, switch of topics. Where are we? By oh, the way, yeah. um, just so you know, guys, um, Sean and Janet and Emma and Crystal, I have been harvesting some of your questions, um, but I, I'm just holding on. I, I want to let Estrus do his thing, and then um, I'll come back to them. I just want you to know I am harvesting some of your questions, and then when we kind of get to the end, if there's a bit of time, we'll, we'll, we'll address some of those. I was with you when you took that picture, and you leant over my shoulder, and you said, no, 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 Mikey, that's not how you do it. Watch and learn. <laughs> that is what he said. That's true. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> so <laughs> so this is the, the Burj Khalifa uh, retail store, tourist store, you know, where they sell the trinkets. 
uh, and Mike was trying to make a photo of all these things. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how it's done. And I just took my phone, I, I, I put it in selfie mode, put it under the glass, and I shot up. It, what the, this whole thing that I'm about to show you is about where the camera, where you put your camera. And that has to do with something that I teach that is called the bubble of perspective. The way you see the world through your eyes, the moment you open your eyes in the morning, that is your bubble of perspective. And somehow in our, our brains are attached to that. Where you move your head, that's how you're going to see the world. What you need to do in order to get really good is you need to start taking that bubble of perspective and moving it to different places within your environment. Meaning that even though I didn't get down on my knees to get this shot, I knew beforehand how with this shot would look because I can take my perspective and put it under the glass and I could sort of imagine how the photo was going to look. Mind you, the fact that the guy's face is perfectly framed and everything works really well. It's a lot of it is luck, but I have done this enough to know that when I extend a photographic device away from me into the end of my extremities, my arms, and put it up or down or behind something, I have an idea of how the photo is going to come. So a lot of the photos that I show you are photos where I never saw because I kind of pre-visualize, I think this photo would look this way if I put my camera there, which is something that you learn to do if you start practicing that skill, trying to pre-visualize things from different perspectives, places that you probably cannot put yourself in. All right. So I'm sorry, Mark, I didn't mean to be an ass about this. <laughs> when I, <laughs> no, but when I told is, you this is not how you do it. <laughs> but this is the thing, you know, I'm often saying to people, people say to me, oh, is it a begin am I a beginner, advanced or intermediate? And I always say, no, we're all beginners, advanced and intermediate because it's like we're all in different places in, in what we do. Now, I'm only guessing that if it comes to you doing super high tech stuff, someone once said to you, do you shoot raw files and what sort of ISO do you recommend? And I seem to recall your response was, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you do what you do and, and we're all in different places. Now, Estrus is an absolute master of noticing moments and all the rest of it. And we're going to be running a workshop together in Ecuador as soon as we are allowed to. But also, I went out shooting with him on the streets in Sharjah in the Arab Emirates. And I learned so much in that couple of hours because, you know, this guy does it all the time. All the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. And he sees things that normal human beings don't because he's not normal. He can't help that. But <laughs> Thank you for calling me abnormal, Mike. You're really welcome. <laughs> Um, anyway, I'll shut this, up. Go this, on, you get on with it. Okay. So this is this is this is along the same lines of putting yourself in places that normally anybody walking by wouldn't see it. So I would, there's a in in the western states of the United States, there are a lot of uh, stock shows, and the stock shows is cattle. In in Colorado, they also happen to sell bisons and all sort of all sorts of uh, animals, your farm animals and stuff. And uh, so it's cattle country. It's, it's meat country. And I saw this cowboy is just chatting it up outside. And if you take a photo of this, of this guy's chatting and talking or whatever, that's just a very boring photo. So you have to try to find a way to make it even more interesting. So I look around and I saw the eat beef license plate. And I immediately in my head, I knew if I put that in the foreground and I get this guys in the background, now that's an interesting photo. So it's a matter of looking around, just look around and start pre-visualizing how my photo will look if I happen to go beyond what's obvious and I try to do something interesting. Uh, same thing. This is uh, one of my well-known photos of street photography. This is in New York. Uh, you guys can recognize the Union Jack, the guy's got in his shoe in the Doc Martens. So I'm walking down the street in New York and I see this guy walking towards me. The moment I have my cameras on me, I am on. When I am on, I pay attention to everything. So I see this guy half a block coming towards me, and I notice his shoes. And I look behind me, and I try to find a place where I can go down and get the shot. So I take like maybe five steps back, back pedal, and go down to my knees. I put my camera down on the ground. Mind you, this camera right here is a is a DSLR, so I couldn't see what was what was being. You know, it didn't have an LCD that comes out like my mirrorless. They have that, and now I use it. But I can still shoot without seeing what's going to happen. So I put the focal point on the right side of the frame. I am not flat on my belly. I'm squatting down. My camera's on the ground. And I'm just hoping when this guy walks into my frame, uh, he's going to be in the right place. And look, he's in the perfect place. And then serendipity smile upon me. And you got a guy with an umbrella in a very wet day. And people are about to take steps. And then 
and this wet day you have the super dry store and in the background you have art on a big sign so there are a lot of things going on here there's just layers and layers of information but this wouldn't have happened had i not foreseen what the possibilities could have been uh this well, i teach a lot things of things in advance isn't it it's, it's I'm... preempting human behavior and stuff um yeah by, by the way i have a quick question I, i'm still harvesting some questions guys we'll come to them at the end we'll see we'll see what time we have okay but by the clive, way Mike, clive, when this clive, extent... clive barton just asked he wanted to know if the eat beef cowboy shot was used on the cover of vegan weekly <laughs> no actually it was used on the cover of the paper that i was working for yeah, yeah. the rocky man knew you're not going to convince many people out there that are in the ranching industry to, er, to be vegetarians. Yeah, I can imagine so, it's, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a swear word out in that neck of the woods. Again, it's that thing about different cultures, you know, cultures within yeah, countries, yeah. cultures within the same, you know, if you like, entity within the U.S. of U.S. citizens, because it's like a religion, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't mess with that. So um, the next one. Okay, so I teach a lot of uh, street photography around the Washington Monument. And this is the famous Vietnam Memorial Wall that's full of names etched in it of all the victims. And uh, everybody that goes by, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people that take photos here never think of putting the camera down in the gutter between the, the granite uh, sculpted walls and, and the people walking. So I just put my camera down because this is what happens. People leave uh, flowers, they leave medals, they leave all sorts of, of things that get, get uh, collected at the end of the day. So I'm walking by, I see that from eye level, and you might think that is a good photo. Yeah, your brain just told you, hello, wake up, there's a photo there. You need to go beyond that, and you need to think, how can I make an extraordinary photo out of that situation? In this case, it was just putting the camera down uh, I put my focusing point where I thought it would be once the camera is down. I, you have to understand, I know that frame so well that I can pre-put that focal point. So when I put the camera down on the ground and I press the shutter and I can feel the Nikon lens kind of zzz, catching something, I know exactly what it caught. I don't need to pull it up and look up because I have an idea what's going to happen. And again, that's just practice. That's just like any good uh, artisan or craftsman that becomes one with their tool. A great mountain climber becomes one with the ice picks. A great sculptor becomes one with his chisel and, and, and mallet and hammer, whatever. It's the same thing. You need to become one with your gear, with your camera. Um, this one is a very, very basic composition. And I actually did a little video about this that, you know, the light is perfect. And I'm walking around looking for street photos. And if you take this photo from my level, this is it's useless. You see, you, you got a bunch of rings to the right side. You have an empty sidewalk. And you have that on, a person walking on the left, but it's not until you put the camera down and you create this composition that you actually. And this one I was I shot it with my mirrorless, so I was able to pull the LCD and I was able to compose it. But it is not until your mind allows you to start thinking on those terms that you actually start seeing this kind of shots. Absolutely, because I mean, you know, this they, it would be kind of boring just shot from normal eye level. Yeah, you know, when you're, it's, yeah, when your eye sees it. over Good and photo. over, it's that repeating thing. Which is, you know, listen to the man, guys, you know, it's all about knowing your tools and, and remembering that you are responsible for your pictures, not your camera. Yeah, yeah. You will don't blame the camera if you miss the photo, because the camera is just a tool. It's, you are the brain behind that camera. Somebody uh, just this said, is... uh, hang on, sorry to interrupt, Esther. So I just, Janet, Janet Cooper is asking so many questions and making so many great observations here. Um, yeah, Janet, Thank you, Janet. Were, Janet is saying, but you have to know about the place and you have to know your tool. Uh, no. She's also just said, but you also have to know how to see it. What would you say to that? Okay, you don't need to know the place because you can drop me anywhere in the world and I will be able to make great photos. As a matter of fact, I... Um, a couple of years back, I was in Israel. Uh, I, I was donating my time for an organization that they taught photography to children that are survivors uh, or they're suffering cancer. So, you know, they were from like seven year olds, eight year olds, all the way to teenagers. And teenagers, you know, teenagers, teenagers are a pain. They challenge everything. You tell them something and they, they're like, <laughs> doesn't matter who you are, they don't care. They're teenagers. And I am talking to, a group of about 20 cancer patients or survivors of teenagers. And 
in, this is just a big open room and they're kind of sitting in a circle or at top of chairs on the floor. And I was telling them that you need to be able to make a good photo anywhere. And this kid just challenges me openly. He's like, oh yeah, you're that good? Make a good photo here, just like that. Could you imagine if I would not have been able to make a great photo there? Which by the way, I did. But that's the point. I, you, it doesn't matter where you drop me, I, have, I am the same person with the same skill set. So it, where I am, it is irrelevant. The good photo, if it's there, I will find it. Um, what was the other thing that she said? Uh, so I'm just having a look. <clears throat> uh, so you need to know, hang on, comments huh. are moving fast. You need to know your tool. You need to know how to see it. Um, and the other one she said was, sorry, it's kind of moved on a bit, Estrus. Oh, that's fine. It's perfect because I, I think you addressed I, it okay. I, th I, th I think my phone, that. Janet just my phone just, just uh, went into a, a stupid mode and answered a call. <laughs> oh. So let me go through all these photos. Um, by the way, when it's when it's like ten minutes and you want to just talk about questions, I can stop because we I was over prepared because another... I don't know. We got about another five minutes, Estrus, and I would love you to talk about you okay, know, the so shot I mentioned earlier about uh, the little boy standing in the street when you were behind the sandbags. I'd love you to talk about that a bit and about your thoughts and feelings at that moment. Okay. Because. Oops, I just led you into the background of my website. Hold on. Hey. Let me go to my portfolio. Estrus.com, portfolio. Oh, let's go to editorial. Sorry. Ooh, that's, that's a great question. Steve. I'm in the middle of a presentation to London, Mincho. I got to call you back. This is a friend from Panama, so I cannot just ignore him. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to editorial. And hopefully the photo that you're looking for is here. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, there we go. That's the photo you're talking about. Where am I looking? Hang on, we're waiting for Can you yes. see? That's the photo. Sorry, Astros, I was harvesting questions. What did you just say you have to leave? No, 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 no. I said oh, okay. it's a friend of Pan of mine from Panama that I couldn't just ignore. I had to tell him because it's yeah, an yeah. international call. It's okay. Um so this photo is made in Basra and those are British uh dragoon troops. Uh, your dragoons are famous. They're just like the Rican Marines or something like that. You've had them forever. Uh, every war that you've ever involved, there's, uh, there's been dragoons out there. So these are dragoon troops, and uh, they're part of the coalition forces that uh, went into Iraq in the early 2000s. And uh, this is in the city of Basra. And I'm just walking around. These guys are, are, have different positions that they're either mining the position or they're by it. And all of a sudden, from the end of the street, we hear that, ta -ta 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 -ta, the staccato of AK-47. And I dive away from the whole thing. And these guys take positions and they start aiming that way. And, uh, you know, eventually you could hear, ta -ta -ta -ta, but it's so far away. They later explained, like, there's no way the AK-47 was going to make it accurately to where they were, but they still needed to be ready. But all along, I am not seeing what's going on because I am not in the line of sight of whomever is shooting. And uh, so, and I, I'm, I'm, and I, how, I wasn't even thinking of coming to this spot until I saw this little kid cross the street. And even though these guys are in high alert with their guns trained at the end of the street, this little kid just stood there with his little, you know, Aladdin looking pants and, and he crosses his arm. He's got this, this smile in his face and he's just watching the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, shoot, if the kid is there, I got to be there. So then I got out from where I was hiding and I made a couple of shots there. And then I told the kid, kid, shoot, shoot, go away. This is dangerous. And he kind of understood that. But uh, yeah, was I scared? Oh, heck yeah. Whomever tells you they're in the presence of dangerous situations, dangerous things, and they're not scared, they're lying to you. The difference between, uh, between what happens and what doesn't happen is, are you going to allow that to fear to freeze you in place, or are you going to push through and do what you got to do? That's it. It doesn't mean that you don't have fear. Everybody has fear. If you don't have fear, you are, there's something wrong in your head. You're missing a, a basic thing in human beings, which is that of self-preservation. And that's what fear is all about. It's about keeping us alive, self-preservation. So yeah, I was scared when I took this photo, but you know, I just saw the kid there and I'm like, God, if the kid is there, I gotta be there. So that's that's the story of this photo. I mean, 
the other thing to me is how quickly human beings can normalize so like this kid has got bullets flying up and down the street he's watching the soldiers but to him it's just like another day it's just it's it has become so totally normalized that he will just come and stand there like that you know you're kind of like holy crap there's bullets whistling down the street and to this kid it's just yeah. like hey what are those crazy soldiers doing now i'm gonna go watch them uh, yeah up close and personal human human resilience is is a peculiar and strange thing um um, are you okay to do a few questions, Estras? I've just harvested a few. Guys, I know yeah, we're at uh, half go past ahead. eight. We usually finish at half eight, but if you'd like to go on for another five or ten minutes, I would imagine we're cool with that. Let me just bring us back on. You want me to stop sharing? Yeah, let's see you again, buddy. Let's see you. Okay. Uh, hang on. I'm slowly getting... Okay, how do I stop sharing? Uh, you know the little cogwheel in the top right corner? I think you'll find it's in there. Oh, there you are. Yeah. So in there, you should be able to stop uh, sharing. Am I still sharing? Yeah, you are. You see the little cogwheel next to the microphone? Click on that. And somewhere there, yeah. it should say... Camera, share screen. You want to stop sharing your screen. Hang on, hang when on. When I on. click on it... Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Go when slowly. I click on You're it, it just wait, goes away. Don't wait. That says share screen. You want to stop doing that. You want to go back to your FaceTime HD camera. The one underneath. Is that it? No, you've just turned it off. <laughs> Here it, he is. Oi. This is embarrassing. This this is how things are. That's cool. Okay, external microphone, FaceTime. That's cool. And hey, okay, look, isn't where this, are we? Isn't, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. That's so maybe cool. people don't need to see me. They just need to see you. No, 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 man. You're the pretty one. I'm the <laughs> one. Um, but, um, okay, how do I do that, though? I am in FaceTime. No, 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 no. It's, it's I don't just, see a button. You, no, well, you've done it. You, we can see you. You changed it. Where, where you were just clicking uh, screen Oh, okay, share, so you can see me now? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Guys, you this is a perfect example you're... of how somebody who's extremely good at something can be extremely bad at so many other things. Yeah. I am not a technical person. I just get immediately like, ooh, what just happened here? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, go ahead. Well, Esther, the guys are used to me as well because I am a complete technical numpty. I am not good with tech. And and I think it's another <laughs> thing that's important, and this is one of the things that blows me away with this group of people, is they're understanding it's it's their creativity. There's a handful of things on a camera you need to know about, but the rest of it is just about thinking different and all those cool things that you just talked about. Let me run th into a couple of questions um, that people, and a couple of comments. So both Emma and Crystal. Crystal, I think, but lives in your town, by the way. She's friends with you on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Does Hi, Sarah Crystal. know about this? Yes, Sarah knows about oh, okay. this. <laughs> uh, Emma and Crystal both had the same question. Do you ever feel the need to stop taking photographs and help out with a situation? Or can you focus enough to become separated from that situation? Um, it depends. It depends. Um, if somebody, if there's a mudslide, and I am photographing the rescue efforts. And I am right at the edge where there's a human chain of people reaching out to pull this one person out of the muck that, where they're, that they're being sucked in. And I'm making those photos. And I know that there's nothing that I can do to help this person down below. It's going to change. I'm going to keep making photos. But if while I'm doing this, I look down because, and not because I felt something on my foot and it is somebody stuck in the muck right on my feet, I will stop taking photos and I will pull them out. Because I believe at the end of the day, you are at first a human being. And at the end of the day, you should still be a human being. What you do in between is your job, your passion. But you should always look out for other people's lives, other people's well-being. So whenever possible, I would rather I stop to help than to actually take the photo if I can help it. I was talking to Mohamed Mohaizen. I don't know if you're familiar. Do you know him, Momo? Um, Mohamed Mohaizen, he... He is another. He's, he's got two Pulitzers as well. You can have a. You can have a. Oh, I know. He's uh. He's uh. He shoots for Geographic. 
he does shoot for, for National yeah, Geographic. Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah. Things. Yes, uh, a photo uh, with uh, multiple color balloons in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Many, just, many, many. Yeah, things. I know who that is. A huge yeah, amount yeah. of work with refugees, but he was heavily criticized because there was a photograph of him when he was photographing refugees arriving on the Greek island of Lesbos. And uh, somebody got a picture of him, and he's, he's helping this woman lift her baby out of this half-sunk boat as they've just been washed up on the shore. And uh, he got a lot of flack. People were saying, you know, hey, you're supposed to be a photojournalist. You're not supposed to get involved. And he said exactly the same thing that you did. He said, I am a human being first and a photojournalist second. And he said, when you know, help, help arrived on the scene and there were rescues, he was the only person on this beach when this boat arrived. Yeah, he no, said, I would have done the same. Arrived, yeah, when help arrived on the scene, he said, how, then I go back to being, to telling this story. How are you not going to, a woman is handing you the, her baby, how are you not going to help? That's just inhumane not to. And you know what? Your, that all goes to your moral compass and your own values. But at the end of the day, your morals are dictated by what you can live with. Could, could you have left with the fact that this woman was so weak that she handed the baby, the baby falls in the water and drowns, and you didn't help? Of course, I couldn't live with that. So, no, my heart goes out to this man. I, mm. I completely get it. Mm, totally. Um, Daniel Hansen asked, when you get so intimately close, what is your general focal length to be able to not invade the moment or person or space? Uh, it's usually a 17 to 35. And I am pretty close. Sometimes I can be right on top of people. Um, you also need to learn to break those comfort zones. There are moments that I have pushed quite a bit, and uh, and I am right there. But a lot of times, you need to let the viewer forget that you exist. And the best way to do that is to actually make the viewer part of the scene. So uh, in a lot of my compositions, you will see that I have a half a face here, a shoulder over here, because I basically just wedge my way in there to make the photo. That doesn't mean that I'm going to linger there for half an hour. I, sometimes I just go, <laughs> and I got the photo that I needed. I'm, and it's not that I shot six frames that are the same. As I'm moving, I'm doing micro adjustments to, to get the photo right, and I walk away. Totally get it. Um, Beverly Devine said, I can sense by the way you speak that you bring sensitivity and empathy to your photo shoots, and that you've just given us all a really Thank great you. lesson, which I would agree with. Um, someone else is asking, do you, uh, June Bannister was asking, do you tend to use primes or zooms? So nowadays I use mostly zooms because um, I do have to cover news events. And, for, and a lot of times you might be stuck in one position and there are 30 other photographers by you and, you, and you're wedged in there. And the person might be on a speaker and you're stuck in that place and you're in a prime lens, as beautiful as that prime lens, if it's the wrong focal length, you're screwed. So you need to be able to have that capacity of going in and out. So that's why I use zoom lenses. Having said that, I love primes. And if I'm doing a, a fashion shoot, if I'm doing if I'm doing nature, if I can actually shoot with a prime, I will I will use prime over a zoom any day. Got it. <clears throat> uh, I think let's just do one last question. And then I guess it's getting close to wrap it up time. Uh, I haven't had a sandwich unlike certain people on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, <laughs> do you worry? Uh, let's have a look. Um, yeah, one last question Stig was asking, do you worry about the so-called rules of photography or is it just the content that is important to you? What rules of photography is Stig talking about? I don't know what that means. <laughs> in, the, in the sense that, look, I don't judge uh, camera club uh, competitions because they have absolute rules. And that absolutely drives me insane. If you have seven people flying in there while they're juggling, and there's a cat flying in between, and there's a lightning going in the background, but the horizon is not straight, there are camera clubs that will say, no, the horizon is not straight, and they will push the photo away. That drives me insane. Every single photo needs to be judged by its own merit and its own content. You need to learn all the rules of photography. I get it. You also need to understand them so well that you can break them if you can tell me why you did it. That is an awesome answer. At the end of the day, it's like 
does it do what you want it to do does does a shot do does it tell the story you want to convey or the emotion you want to convey or or we live in a world of instagram which goes next 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 and actually to capture someone's attention just for even a moment is actually quite hard to do these days and yeah. in order and whether they like the picture or not is actually irrelevant isn't it it's whether or not You've actually made someone stop and go back for a minute and go, hey, whoa, hang on a minute, and they want to think about it. And they might decide they like it, they might decide as, they hate it. But As a matter of fact, when it comes to Instagram, I have learned the painful way that sophisticated storytelling images, they don't really do that well most of the time. You take a photo that is multiple layer of events happening, and the more you look at it, if it were big, the more you would get involved with it versus a, a, a photo of a beautiful spire of an architectural shot with a beautiful sunset behind the photo with the sunset because the colors are so bright and the recognition of the shapes is so quickly people will gravitate towards that so instagram has its own rules mm -hmm. by the way i put estress underscore zero zero one for everybody who's watching this to follow me on instagram please <laughs> estress zero zero one I should. That's right. What I will do afterwards, Estrus, if you can email that to me, I'll stick it into the uh, description area below this video, this this live feed. After we've finished, I can't interfere with it during the live, but I will stick no it problem. in there. That's so if okay. you want to come back in a minute, that'd be cool. I will also stick it into our photography lockdown group so that you guys who've been here, if you want to go check that out. Also, I'd strongly recommend you check out the link in the description area below. Go check out some of Estrus's work because there's been quite a few comments saying, you know, do you ever do anything, you know, not quite so heavy duty? And yes, you've already answered that question, but I guess, you know, people miss things. Go have a look at his portfolios of everything from portraits to food photography to you name it. This man will shoot it. So I guess we need to kind of draw a line under it now. It's it's 10 minutes over time. Estrus, thank you so very much for coming and giving You're up welcome, your Maggie. time to come and talk to everybody. Um, what more can I say? If you want to have an amazing photographer do a portfolio review for you, again, go to his website, go have a look, because he will give you a very honest critique, and it will be very constructive, um, and also delivered from the right place, from the heart, to, to genuinely help. So One of the things, yeah, let me go. make a quick comment about that. Um, when it comes to portfolio reviews, because I work under so many talented editors, not only did I learn how to, what, what works and what doesn't work, but I also learned how to deliver the critiques and how not to deliver them. I remember my heart being broken many, many times when I, I waited five hours to get a shot and then the editor looks at it, this is not good, go back. You know, there are better ways of saying that kind of stuff, so I don't do that to people. <laughs> you know, if I, I, I tell people what, what's working, that they're doing, that they need to keep doing, and the things that they're working that doesn't work. So I think even when you fail, there's a lesson there. So it's it's all good. It's all good. It certainly is. Thank you very much again for joining us, Estrus. Well, there has been many comments coming up through this uh, with people saying thank you and that you've inspired them and excited them and kind of reignited the little fire because for you know some thank you very much my down, pleasure it has gone out thank you thank, thank you. you everybody uh, for being here and for listening uh, the next photography lockdown challenge will go live in a moment that's one of the reasons i've got to wrap it up because there's an automated email going out saying here's your next challenge and if i haven't put it live <laughs> okay cool thank you mike appreciate it i'm out of here thanks everyone thank you my friend thank you everybody we'll see you next time bye-bye okay ciao, ciao. bye